uh, as he dies, he writes in blood in the ground, Credo, I believe, uh, and his companion, Brother Dominic, is there about to be stabbed by, uh, by one of the assassins. And the trees, I'm not sure you can see this, but in the foreground, perhaps you can make it out, the tree in the left-hand corner bleeds in sympathy with the, uh, with the, the saint who is here uh, martyred. So I'm, I was puzzled as to why this... Uh, this was something that you uh, wanted to dwell it, on. It was, I think it, was, it, it has to do with the simplicity of simply putting a shadow around a large round orb, which makes the shadow of the eye and the extraordinary closeness and deadness of the eye. Mm. So that, uh, that went into my head as a kind of a note. Just a big round brush mark around the empty space makes the... So it's very much a kind of a workman's okay. looking at how it's constructed and what it can be made. I mean, there would be a separate question of looking at foliage, ha having painted trees. There was a secondary looking at all the different ways the artists uh, who'd painted trees in the gallery had looked and approached um, And I think we have, we have one of these, which is um, our uh, Lucas Cranach, the elder, Adam and Eve, which I'm, I was so pleased you sort of picked this. This is uh, this sort of is part of my own sort of first memory of the Courtauld Gallery when I came as a uh, as a young student, and this was a picture I, I just uh, sort of burnt itself into my visual memory. Um, and it is, of course, a story from Genesis, uh, Eve and Adam at that fateful moment where uh, he is offered and accepts the apple standing underneath the tree of knowledge, surrounded by, uh, by animals. Um, it is, though, I think, singularly sort of um, lacking in any of the sort of portentous qualities that one might associate with this uh, moment. And it is, in a sense, sort of delightful and can be enjoyed on a very different uh, level. And there's even, I think, a sort of touch of humor in it. And maybe this is what I remember as sort of a, a, a student, as, as sort of Adam scratches his head, thinking, you know, this, this probably is not a good idea, but that, that apple, <laughs> looks so tasty that I'm just going to take a big bite. And uh, curiously, they, there was a drawing um, for this painting, a preparatory drawing, which is now lost, in which um, uh, Eve actually puts the, ad the apple into Adam's mouth, sort of almost forces him to take a bite. So she's even more fully responsible for the fall of man than she is here. <laughs> but the... the this tree, which stands in for, or this painting for various other ones, just to talk about how images sediment themselves in us. For some years, I've been painting images of trees with Indian ink on different pages of uh, dictionaries or encyclopedias, 19th and 18th century encyclopedias, partly because of the way the paper absorbs the ink. It's got the right amount of size in it, partly because it's not a blank sheet of paper. It has a kind of history in it, and the painting of the trees, as I said, came about because I had a bad paintbrush that was good at leaves but bad at clear lines. Um, and I'd been painting, thinking in my head of um, Claude Lorrain or other landscape painters and what it was to paint a tree. And it was only after I'd been painting these, making these trees for about two years that I was not in your gallery but at the Kunsthistorische Museum in, in Vienna where I came across a memling of the same subject. And, Adam and Eve, The Temptation, where it suddenly struck me what I had been painting. And I thought, of course, the Ur, the central image of the tree in Western art, is this tree. And what had I been painting? I'd been painting trees on encyclopedias. These were trees of knowledge. And this is a, but this had been a completely kind of absent thought until I'd suddenly re come across it. But I'm interested to what extent it was one of the things that sits inside you so that when you're painting a tree, there's an unconscious voice saying, yes, the tree has many associations. Go with the tree. Don't question what they are. You don't have to know. Just keep going with the tree, and it will tell you what it is in, in due course. Um, I mean, there's also, an, it was also kind of a, I was caught when I first started going to museums like the Courtauld or the National Gallery of being a little bit realizing I was so much in the terrain of the Manet beautiful arm of the woman at the bar at the Folie Bergère, or for me at the age of 15 being completely struck by the Botticelli uh, Venus. 
that it was kind of a shock to think, is this northern vision of what a woman's body should ideally look like was a kind of a, a shock and a recalibration. Um, and so there was also no doubt, there's something about there was certainly at that age, and I'm sure it also sits inside one of the erotics of looking, of what it is to look and look away, to catch a glance, to be held by something, to be held by an attraction which at a certain point just turns into the paint and the technique of the, of the artist. But uh, an erotics of looking not just at naked women or naked men, but at this transformation of the world into matter, into paint. And it's interesting what you were saying about how one sort of, one's eye sort of completes images, that these animals, which are all just most beautifully painted, uh, all of them Cranach would have seen. He was uh, a very close member of the retinue of um, the electors of Saxony and a very good friend of Martin Luther's as well. The only animal he wouldn't have known is the lion, who looks a little bit sort of like a, like a sort of lap dog in... Uh, in, in Chelsea, but curiously, the point I wanted to make was that this horse uh, at the back, we get lots of people um, writing in to us with questions about the unicorn in the Cranach painting. And uh, in fact, I sort of feel that I may once have thought it was a unicorn as well. There's no, there is no horn there or anything. It is just that the, the sort of way it's... It's photoshopped out, it's there. <laughs> I always the thought it was a unicorn. The way it's sort of prancing and, you know, it's sort of you suddenly, it's the remembered images of unicorns from childhood and so on that makes us a unicorn. We will press on, um, and this we might skip, William, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, jump. And head into the 19th century with uh, this very um, unusual uh, painting by, uh, by Degas, which um, is unfinished by conventional standards, as you can uh, tell, but uh, manages in the most wonderful sort of abbreviated way to capture this sense of this woman seen contre jour against sort of strong daylight uh, through uh, a window. A little bit of background on it, it was um, bought in the very early 20th century, first years of the 20th century, from the dealer Durand Ruel by the English artist Walter Sickert, who was a friend of Degas. Um, and Digger, uh, Sickert said he'd been stalking this painting for 12 years. He was able to buy it now, he said, for 300 uh, pounds, having sold to the American collector Henry Havermeyer a ballet scene for 4,000 um, pounds. And he felt that this was the masterpiece uh, uh, by Digger. He then writes, curiously, in a little book that he has, a, a, a book on Degas later, he says that, Dig, that Degas told me that uh, this painting was made during the siege of Paris when the Prussian army was uh, besieging the city um, and when there was great sort of hardship and famine and that Degas had found this model who he described as a cocotte um, and had given her as part payment a lump of raw meat that she could go home and cook, but she was so uh, famished uh, that she fell upon it and devoured the whole thing raw on the spot. That may be, it's a horrible story, but it may be apocryphal um, still that these sort of narratives, you know, feed into the uh, image from a very early stage. I mean, I think there are a couple of things about this this wonderful painting. Firstly, we see it backwards through the Matisse Red Studio, in which is a painting with a monochrome color with single lines that define the space and the object in the studio. And he may well not have, most probably didn't ever see this painting, which would have been in Britain, of that chair against the wall of the studio. But seeing it backwards, one can see how much um, Degas is influenced by, Manet, by Matisse. Mm. But also, it's interesting, the, it's interesting to think of the um, of the Paris Commune, and I'm doing a project at the moment which looks at the Cultural Revolution in China in 1968, and student uprisings in Paris in 1968, and both of them referring back to the Paris Commune of 1871. And one of the extraordinary things, I've been looking at the old newspapers from the days of the Commune, and in it, they have wonderfully diverse things, no, apart from the military descriptions of what's happening during the siege, 
and the price of food and all of those things. There are reports on the travels of the Tsar of Russia and the discovery of a big diamond on the diamond fields in South Africa. But there are also several notices about the, uh, about the Beaux-Arts, about the different parts. And one of them is saying that in spite of being under siege by the, um, by the Prussians and the commune being there, the competition for the Prix de Rome would still go ahead at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Another was saying that all actors and artists have to appear at the Théâtre du Châtelet for military training to go to their positions on the different ramparts of the city. So there's a sense, again, bringing to this afterwards, certainly not something I knew when I first saw it, neither Matisse nor the history of the commune, of these things sitting and hovering around the painting. In the painting itself, the thing that's kind of miraculous is if you look in the... Um, if you look just next, the red, oh, the red button, yeah. Uh, where's the red button? There. If you look over there, okay. We see two things. We're seeing the street across the road, and we can see the, the windows and even the pediments of the windows across the road. But primarily what we're seeing is seven daubs of burnt umber placed on the, on the canvas, seven brush strokes quickly placed down, which hover so beautifully between being just these seven brush marks and being completely descriptive and evocative of distance, of space, of the other building, of the architecture of Paris that tell us we're in Paris, not in a difference. And that's something, again, which would be very hard to think of Degas thinking, how do I, in seven brush marks, show the street across the way, rather than saying, within this action, that's what I'm responding to, what's over there and putting the marks down with a kind of trust that if you work and you're connected to it closely, the world will come back to you in the associations you make with the marks. Shall I, uh, thank yeah. you. So we're staying with, uh, with, with the Impressionists. Um, one of the real sort of masterpieces of the Courtauld's collection is this uh, work by, uh, by Renoir, La Loge, The Theatre Box painted in 1874 and um, importantly exhibited by Renoir in that famous first Impressionist group, uh, group show. Um, and the subject matter, I think, will be obvious to you, but just quickly to summarize, so a couple seated in a box in a loge at one of Paris's elegant theatres, the, the woman um, for whom a professional model uh, uh, sat has lowered her opera glasses and is looking directly out at the audience, at us, in anticipation of our sort of admiring sort of gazes. The, uh, the man, modelled by Renoir's brother, Edmond, is not doing what he conventionally should be doing and looking down at the, uh, at the ballet or the opera, but he is doing um, the opposite. He is scanning uh, the other opera boxes uh, and seats to uh, admire uh, companions who might, I mean, admire women who might uh, rival his companion in sort of beauty and allure. So this is all about the sort of uh, the play of gazes that um, was part of the sort of modern character of the city that Renoir was uh, so interested in. It was, of course, subject matter that was deemed totally unsuitable and inappropriate for, for high art, and hence its rather sort of uh, extraordinary uh, reception in 1874. I mean, for me, it's interesting that in my head, although I know the painting very well, I'd seen the woman as having the opera glasses in front of her, that's because the drawings which I've done based on the Tyrellis, it's always the woman with the opera glasses. And there's something about the opera glasses themselves that have to do with their rich blackness. And there's almost nothing there. You could be painting just a line of blackness across the eyes, like a kind of identity parade where you're hiding the identity of, a, of, uh, of the man. And it's just a few highlights that are needed to turn them from this black band across the eyes into the very clear binoculars or, or opera glasses. And I suppose that, that image of someone looking has stayed in partly because of the pleasures of drawing in charcoal, the blackness of binoculars or opera glasses, but I'm sure also, as you say, for the associations of a returned gaze, the activity of looking, continuing from the picture frame backwards out or across into, into, something, into something else. <laughs> 